welcome and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm always excited to talk about writing and writing our stories. I'm going to be sharing a lot of what I have done in hopes that it will encourage and entice you to also write your story, write your family's story. I'm going to start with a little bit of reasons why I think this is important. But again, I just want to give you all warning or a heads up. I'm going to be sharing a lot of my own thoughts and stories. And the reason for that is to have you think about doing that same kind of a thing. Not that we have to necessarily all do the same thing, but I have encountered so many people uh, throughout my career. Uh, here in the Genealogy Center and around the country, who are going to get around to writing someday. And you know what? You can finish that, can't you? You can answer that question. They never get around to it. They never quite pull the trigger on it. There's always something better, different to do, something more pressing. Well, I'm here today to say two major things. One, writing can be enjoyable. We need to work toward making it that. And two, some perfect day will never come. You need to find the instances and the moments in every day uh, to make that happen. So if we're really interested, if we really think that what we do is important, and I would argue that it is, finding our family stories is very important, then we need to write our family stories as well. So, so how do we do that and why is that important? Well, I think writing our family stories, writing our family history, is important because story is powerful, is very, very powerful. I think we've known that for generations, but here in the 21st century, particularly in the last decade or so, we've put a finer point on how powerful story is. It really does change people's lives. Several years ago, a big thing in the business community was, you need to tell your story. You need to tell the story of your company, your venture, what you want to do, your product, how you help people, how you lift people up. We as family historians, we've known that forever. Story is powerful. Story sells. And we have many stories. We have many, many stories. Educators and sociologists are telling us how powerful story is in the lives of our kids. Children who know more about their family stories are better able to bounce back from tragedies. All of 2020 seemed like a serial tragedy, and it's invaded 2021 as well. The same psychologists and educators and sociologists tell us that children are more accepting of diversity and change in every part of their life if they know their family stories. That's pretty amazing. For children, knowing their stories brings out their best possible selves. Why wouldn't we want to write our stories if this is the case, if this is really true? And I'm one that happens to believe it is true. Their best possible selves. Science is supporting how important story is and knowing our stories. Again, psychologists, sociologists claim that experiencing a story, telling a story, hearing a story, hearing and telling a story, literally alters the neurological, neurochemical processes in our brain. It affects us physiologically. It changes our mood. It changes our feelings about ourselves. That's pretty amazing. They claim, not just Kurt, not just me, they, the professionals in the medical field, in the mental field, claim that stories are a powerful force in shaping human behavior oh my goodness, why wouldn't we want to write our stories when we know that such activity will be so meaningful to us and to our family members who are living with us now and family members we will never meet, the grandchildren of our grandchildren's grandchildren will benefit from our stories. So that's reason number one of why stories are important. Reason number two is I passionately believe, and I believe for years, that the loss of living memory remains critical. It's a critical thing in the genealogy space, in the family history space. I've heard it so many times, I almost hate to admit this, but I've heard this so many times 
that I find myself almost getting angry when people say, oh man, I should have interviewed fill in the blank, grandma, great aunt, fellow colleague, whomever, but gosh, they just passed away. Well, that's really on us. We need to own that. Um, and that is a tragedy. What's that old saying? Uh, something about every time a person dies, a library goes away, the, the accumulated wealth and knowledge and story goes away. So what we have walking around on top of our shoulders is a library. Who has access to that? How do we provide access to that? I'm all for experimenting with new and different things. I'm a great advocate of telepathy. If someone can make that work, that would be awesome. But right now, I think orally recording or keying, writing our stories is the best way to share our living memory. If you think about it, just pause for a, a couple of minutes after this presentation or during this presentation if you're tired of hearing me talk, and just think of all the things that you know that possibly no one else in your family knows. The road trips you've taken, the holidays you've celebrated, the things you've done with a circle of friends that no one else is a part of. Wow. Well, our living memory is immense. How can we share that? Right now, the best way to share that is to, is, is to write it, to key it, to scribe it so that it can be shared. Judy Russell said this, so I give her credit here. Um, in a couple of presentations I heard years ago, if we don't consistently, purposefully, accurately tell our stories, those stories could be lost in just three generations. So if my grandparents didn't tell their stories, and I'll have to confess they didn't, I spent very little time with them. My parents kept us apart. Whole another story that, by the way, I have written about. In just three generations, my kids won't know that information. Well, I've modified Judy's saying a little bit and I've changed the tell to write. And I believe that this is interchangeable. If we don't consistently, purposefully, accurately write our stories, those stories could be lost in just three generations. That's a lot of burden on us. We don't have to be mad about that. We don't have to kind of shrink under that burden. I think we just need to own it, that we have responsibility to share, to share these stories. The third thing, and then we'll get into some writing prompts. The third reason why I think writing our stories is so critically important, it makes our research more transferable. And you're thinking to yourself, what in the dickens do you mean, Kurt? More transferable. Well, so I've heard more than a few times throughout my career, um, people on the more mature side of life, I guess I'll have to include myself in that group of people, the people on the more mature side of life lamenting the fact that, well, you know, no one in the younger generation cares about this. You know, none of my children or grandchildren care about this. Boy, when I die, they're just going to throw all this stuff away. Well, I'm going to ask a difficult question. So whose fault is that? I'm thinking we own a lot of that responsibility. Why do we own a lot of it? Because we haven't told them our stories. We haven't written our stories. When we look to pass our family history along, is it just a collection of old documents and computer files? Or do our children and grandchildren and nephews and great nieces, do they know what's there? Is there a story there? Have we written that story? Have we told that story? I think if we were honest in the cold, sober chill of the night, we'd have to admit, no, no, we haven't done such a good job writing and telling those stories. So writing our stories makes it more transferable. These are wonderful experiences experiences parents have had with children and grandparents have had with grandchildren. If it's just an experience, if it's just a memory, then it's part of our living memory and no one has access to that except us. So when we have a great experience with a child or a grandchild, we need to write about it. This is a wonderful experience too. There's such a bond 
between grandparents and grandchildren, explaining, showing, making the younger people feel more comfortable with their surroundings and able to enjoy their surroundings more. If we don't write about that, again, that's just a living memory, which is awesome, but not nearly as awesome if it's a written memory that people can enjoy and can benefit from. I'm gonna show you a slide in an instant, and I'm gonna ask you, who is really gonna be excited about this? Without writing our stories, this is what we're presenting to our descendants, to our family. This is what we're lamenting that our family is not embracing. Collections of papers may be quasi-organized and collections of computer files. Without us writing our story, you know what this is? It's exactly what it looks like, a collection of stuff. And if there's no tie to the stuff, if there's no emotional tie, factual tie, family tie, then it is what it looks like, a collection of stuff. And we really can't be upset at, quote, the younger generation, unquote, by not embracing this and taking these boxes of stuff and trying to organize it. We do some of that trying to organize when we receive manuscript collections, and we're grateful for them. But as you see in front of you right now, it's a heavy lift to organize most of these. Why? Because there's nothing written. There's no written story about whole, how all these documents and all these papers come together. Notice, and I'll move my cursor around, this blue piece of paper, this yellow piece of paper, these red pieces of paper, this yellow piece of paper down here, this green sheet over here, these yellow sheets here. That's one of our team here in the Genealogy Center trying to discern what the story is that connects all these documents together. Why are we doing that? Because no one wrote the story. No one related how all these documents interact with each other and how the documents help support and tell a story. So story is really, really important. Um, it's, I hope, why we're doing what we're doing as family historians. We're trying to find, preserve, and push forward our stories. So writing, let's own this fact. Writing typically isn't easy. I think we equate writing to some of our less pleasant educational experiences. When I was going to school back in the Stone Ages, you know, they, they were conditioning in schools. What? Stop talking that crazy talk. We didn't have air conditioning. We had big fans that made noise and everyone sweated. And so I think we equate writing with unpleasant things. That's unfortunate. I think we need to flip that. We need to equate writing with more pleasant things. I think the desire, the want to tell our story, to write our story, plus experience, actually doing it, then we'll come out with some pleasure, with some enjoyment. So desire plus experience equals enjoyment. Uh, we need to start doing it. Find a way to make it comfortable and to make the recording of memories and living memories and the explaining of documents something that's enjoyable. And pretty soon you'll be writing hundreds of words before you even knew you picked up a pen or turned your computer on. I always encourage people, record your unique thoughts and events with your unique words. You see unique twice there and highlighted in red. You don't need to write perfectly. It doesn't need to be syntactically incorrect. Okay, I see chat blowing up with English teachers and grammarians telling me, oh, this is terrible. Uh, no, it's not. If we want to use double negatives and ain't and incomplete sentences, and singular plural disagreement, that is okay. Because it's your words and your thoughts. There's no right way to record your memories. I know that's antithetical to some people who like rules and like to look at the world more in black and white than in gray. But really, don't let that be an obstacle. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's your thoughts and your unique words. And don't think that you have to start at the beginning or any concept of the beginning. 
So let's say you want to write about a really unique experience, a pleasurable, wonderful family experience you had this summer in the middle of the pandemic. Dive in and do it. There are some people who say, well, maybe I shouldn't start with the campfire or the storytelling or the virtual reunion we had. I need to start with how we planned it. And then I need to start giving Aunt Jane and Uncle Joe credit. And it's like, you know, if you want it to be from the beginning to the end, perfectly grammatical, et cetera, you're making it unpleasant for yourself. You're making it difficult. And how many of us today will walk a half a block out of our way to have an unpleasant time? I know I wouldn't. I don't do much of anything uh, that's really unpleasant because life gives us enough unpleasant things, right? So you don't need to start at the beginning. Start wherever you want to start. Start at the end. Start what's comfortable. Start with the idea that pops into your brain. Just do it. Apologies to Nike for borrowing their little uh, statement there. Uh, devise, develop, or borrow some kind of strategy where you don't get caught up in the details of, is it the right paper? Am I using the right software? Uh, gee, my monitor doesn't seem to be quite adjusted, right? Boy, my keyboard's a little sticky today. Uh, just do it. Just find a way to do it. Um, as I just mentioned a couple minutes ago, um, don't edit your stuff um, unless it really gives you pleasure to do that. Um, I like to tell people you're writing, not publishing, right? You know, this isn't going to be, sorry, don't mean to disappoint anyone. This isn't going to be a Pulitzer Prize winning book. This is just your amazing thoughts, your wonderful experiences in your words. And again, grammar's out the window. There's all kinds of places for grammar. We write enough memos in our lives. We write enough business plans and proposals and make enough reports. We have plenty of time to exercise grammar. This is a time to exercise sharing writing. So don't worry about, about editing. Find your spot in time. Find a place in your home. Uh, if you have the ability to use your work office during off hours, find a spot somewhere that isn't a place that distracts you or a place that has bad memories. Like if your den or your study at home is always where you have arguments with family members, where you're paying bills, where you're handling legal matters, well, maybe that's just not the right aura for you to sit down and actually key something. Maybe you take your iPad or your tablet, both paper tablet or electronic tablet to the kitchen table, or maybe you sit on the floor in a bedroom and write about your living memory. Find your spot, find your time, uh, and just do it. Uh, engage your senses, all of them, sight, smell, sound, touch, taste. Um, sight is really important, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, because we're going to talk about that first, I put it first, smell. I put second because smell is really important. Your olfactory nerve, your sense of smell, your ability to smell, that is the number one memory trigger. So if you like a particular candle scent, if you like the smell of coffee or a latte or a pie or a toasted bagel, whatever it is, sometimes making yourself a little snack just to get some nice aroma in the area where you're going to write. It's amazing. Good smells sometimes bring back good memories. Smell always is an amazing memory trigger. Think about it. Try it sometime. If you have a piece of old clothing, a sash, a military uniform, uh, even hairpins. Um, sometimes we'll have a smell to them. Think about it. That smell brings back memories right away. There are certain smells that put me right back at 417 East 14th Street in Jasper, Indiana. Where is that? That's the house my father grew up in. And we went to visit his mother a few times in our life. One time we got to spend a week there. It was an amazing time. I've written almost a book on the visit that we had and all the games my older brother and I played uh, that were just wonderful games as in getting grandma to do things that mom and dad didn't really want us to do. It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. And we got away with a lot of things, nothing criminal, just things that mom and dad didn't want us to do. And as kids, isn't that an awesome thing? And so I wrote about that, but a couple of smells can put me right back in her kitchen. 
So smell, sound, touch, taste. So writing prompts. Finally, we're back or we're, we're to the meat of what I want to share with you today. So I'm going to come up with a host of writing prompts, um, not quite a dozen, um, but these are things if you're saying, well, Kurt, I just don't know what to write about. Number one writing prompt is pictures and pictures at many different levels. So we're going to take a look at a few pictures. I'm going to tell you about how I've written about these and see if that doesn't trigger some ideas and maybe some movements toward you doing something writing wise or keying wise pictures are huge we've all heard this a thousand times a picture is worth a thousand words i may be wrong but i bet there's not a single person watching this right now that doesn't come up with or who doesn't come up with dozens and i mean that literally dozens of thoughts and memories just based on looking at this little kid's face. I've written about this look, if you will. I was always fascinated as a father of four, how soon, how early in life babies fix on the faces of their parents or their caretakers. Look at this little kid here. He is so happy. He has connected his eyes to the person who's raising him up or holding him up. Um, it's just amazing. That face, that kind of a face, not this particular one, but that kind of a face has launched many of my writings as I think back, and as I remember, and as I lived through uh, raising four boys. Um, just amazing. Um, not only do children fix on the faces of their parents, they listen if they have good audio abilities they listen and they can tell so much in the tone of their parents or grandparents or siblings voices they hear happiness they hear excitement it's it, it's amazing so a picture is worth a thousand words so all those pictures that you have on your phone on your computer in your photo albums each one of those pictures seriously challenge yourself pull everyone up or look at everyone and write a couple sentences about it. And you might say, I can't do that, Kurt, because I don't know most of the people in half of my pictures. You can still write about, what do you think? If you look at a picture and you say, I wonder if that was Uncle Jake. Has his nose, but his ears don't seem right. Or his, I didn't know his hair was that color when he was younger. That's worth recording because that gets you into the habit of writing. Pictures, if they're just pictures in our photo album, even if they have names and dates on the back of them, that's not as robust as if we write about those pictures. That's what we should be doing as family historians. So I like this picture a lot. One, this picture is evidence for all of you that sometime in my life, I actually had hair and it was dark. So that's thing number one. When I look at this picture, this is my second son, Brian. What you don't know about Brian is he was an uber colicky baby the first eight to nine months of his life. So this picture reminds me that there are other facets to Brian's first year of life than him just being colicky. I know I'm a proud father, but look at that smile. Who couldn't melt a little bit with that smile? And I know I'm probably reading into it a little bit but he's got a twinkle in his eye at least his father thinks he has a twinkle in his eye so i can write and have written paragraphs about that so this picture launches me back in my mind to some of my earlier writings about him being colicky about how his mother and i had to split up the day so i was with him well into the night so that his mother could get some sleep and she was with him during the day my father-in-law took our eldest son most of the time during the day because my wife had to deal with Brian being so colicky. So this picture brings that back, makes me look for those writings, maybe even add to those writings. And it makes me, and it did make me write about the full Brian. Yeah, the squirmy, fussy, crying, colicky baby. But there were moments where it ah, makes it kind of worthwhile, right? So this picture, I can write so many and have written 
so many things. You can do the same thing with many, if not most, if not all of the pictures that you have. And how many of us have thousands of pictures? You have several books of writing that's in your brain waiting to come out just based on the pictures that you have. Whenever I see a cemetery in the rain, it conjures up in my mind and I have written many pages about the death of my first cousin. She died in her 40s and it's kind of spooky when a first cousin dies. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. I thought way more elderly people than my first cousin died in their 40s. But she had a freaky thing, totally no symptoms, no anything. It was an abdominal aneurysm. In most cases, high 80% of the cases, you bleed out before you know there's been anything wrong. Uh, so um, I have told this story, and I've written, again, many pages about this. But I have a little phrase that I use called, I believe in angels. And I do believe in angels, at least in a part of my mind, because that's my way of explaining what happened at the cemetery. So it was an overcast day when Brenda's funeral was, and the ride to the cemetery was pretty amazing. Not a thunder cloud in the sky, no thunder, no lightning. When we got to the cemetery, the skies just opened up as though someone had turned on a faucet. The rain came straight down. You've all been in places and had times in your life where the rain just comes straight down because there's absolutely no wind. The cemetery groundskeepers got poles and they ran around putting poles up in the middle and the sides of the tent over the place where the grave had been opened up for the casket because they had to keep the water from collapsing the tent. And a thought came to me and I wrote about it later. Um, like, wow, that was so freaky. Uh, rain wasn't predicted. Again, no lightning, no thunderclouds, no rain clouds. It was just a gray overcast sky as we've all experienced, particularly here in Fort Wayne for the first part of 2021. I thought it was such a sad funeral, such a sad occasion. I think the angels were crying. And so I, I wrote sort of a literary piece about that, but I captured my thoughts and my feelings about Brenda, an awesome first cousin. She was kind of the glue that held our dysfunctional family together uh, at reunions and many reunions. Um, she is still being missed. So I look at pictures like that. And I can write again, write anew, or just even read some of my earlier writings. So this is my mom. I took this, or I had this picture taken uh, because of COVID uh, last week. So this picture is less than seven days old. So this is my mom. I know I can't see your faces, but I bet this 82-year-old, almost 83-year-old woman brings up some memories in your mind of aunts and uncles and parents and grandparents. And when I take a look at Doris, my mother, and I've written about this, um, you may take a look at that face and see someone smiling. She must be happy. She must be content. Um, I've spent a few days with my mother over the course of my life and she with me. And to me, and I've written about this, I would encourage you to do this to do the same when you look at pictures. She's smiling because that's what she's supposed to do. Her eyes, the way one's on the right-hand side, just a little more tightly closed than the other one. And her smile is more, for those people who don't know her, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know this, her smile is a little bit more of a forced, almost smirk smile. And to me, I know the caretakers at the facility where she's a resident took this to give us comfort. But to me, that face says, I'm not really happy right now. I'm not really sure that I like it here right now. And they've been secluded because of COVID, etc. So I've written about this picture, even though it's less than a week old, I would encourage you to do the same thing. So here's a woman who's lived you know, more than eight decades of her life. She's in a really good, knock on wood, uh, care facility, but COVID is spiking there as it is everywhere, nearly everywhere in the country. And that smile, well, it, it says a lot to me. It doesn't say I'm really happy here. It's, 
Um, I'm not very happy here. And so we, I, I write about that. And, and I would encourage you to do that same kind of thing. Ideas, memories, thoughts will come into your mind. Pictures are wonderful uh, for that. So one more uh, story. I told you I'd be telling you stories. So sugar-coated gumdrops. I'm going to share literally some of the writing that I did years ago about Grandpa's house. In the picture dictionary of life, my father-in-law would be definition number one under awesome grandfather. He was awesome. So I wrote years ago. I put in many weekends early in my library career when my boys were young. But oh, did they have such grand times at Grandpa's house on the Saturdays I worked. When they came home, hot from the day's activities. And see, I missed a little punctuation mark with days, so don't put that in chat because I don't care. So when they came home, hot from the day's activities, parenthetically, even if it was winter, they always told stories with such great excitement about what Grandpa had told them or shown them. And this exclamation just rang through the house, the exclamation, Grandpa said, and then they tell me, Grandpa said, echoed through the house. Just before they would leave Grandma and Grandpa's house, Grandpa would wrap gumdrops in plastic wrap, put a few coins next to each group of candy, and then double wrap the whole thing again. Each one of the guys, all four of my kids, each one of the guys got one of those treats. They would come running in the house, or I would unstrap them from their car seats, and their little hands would be clutching that precious little package from Grandpa years ago after my wife and I became empty nesters, we were cleaning out a closet and we found one of these gum drop coin wrap packages in the bottom corner of a closet. And it was like it brought all those memories back. Each one of you on this presentation, on the Zoom call, in this presentation, you have experiences similar to this. You really need to write about it. And why not? When I say pictures, so we talked about pictures like this, but I can see this in a store, these gumdrops. I can see them in a magazine. I can see them online, and it still comes back to me, this story. And I write even more about Grandpa's house. So picture can be at many different levels, even a picture of people we don't know. I don't know who these people are, but I've written a couple of little paragraphs over the years about these people. So the woman in the very bottom on the right, she looks like she knows a secret. I wonder what secret she knows. The guy in the middle, you know, the contrarian, the snark part of Kurt has to say, what's up with him? He kind of looks like a, a little serious and I can conjure up people in my family that he looks like. Now you might think this is stretching it a little bit, but that's how we can use visual cues, pictures as writing prompts. Don't tell me you can't think of anything to write about because even looking at an old photograph album like this, there's gotta be something that comes into your mind about family, about your life, about your experiences, about the experiences of people that you know that are triggered by, by these pictures. So if you really believe that you have nothing to write about, I would challenge you to get an, open an electronic album on your smart device or a physical photo album. I challenge you to write two sentences, even if you don't know anyone in the album, write two sentences about every single picture. You'll be amazed. A, it will become more enjoyable as you go through the album. And B, you'll be amazed at what your mind puts together from your experiences. Sometimes we need sensory triggers to call things out of our memory, to make living memory come forward so that we can write it down. Um, I challenge you, I challenge you to do that. Second writing prompt, recipes and cooking. Why is that important? A lot of families have passed recipes down through the ages, almost like Bibles and photograph albums. It's also important because of what I mentioned earlier, our olfactory nerve, our sense of smell, is an awesome, the strongest memory trigger. My colleague Allison has done a couple of programs on heritage cooking. 
uh, it's wonderful what she's articulated about the neat part, the family history, the family stories that are in recipes and around cooking. I have a slightly different take. So anytime I see chili, um, please don't tell my mom this. She'll get very upset with me for sharing this. But she was kind of a, well, let's be kind and say average. I guess on some days I would say not a very good cook, but okay, we'll say an average cook. Um, really didn't like to cook a whole lot. So us kids did a lot of cooking. My grandmother on my father's side, my paternal grandmother did some cooking when she came to visit. My dad did some cooking. But whenever I see chili, I always think of my mom because she made what she called chili. It has nothing to do with what people today think of as chili with spicing and all the chili cook-offs. Every time I hear a chili cook-off, up pops the memory of my mom calling this chili. What is this? It's browned ground beef, kidney beans, some tomato sauce, some sliced up potatoes, and whatever else vegetable wise she had around. It's great winter food. I love her quote, chili, unquote. It really isn't anything like the competitive chili that we have, but it was one of the things that she did really well. Um, she doesn't do recipes really well, doesn't do a lot of intricate things, but kidney beans, brown ground beef, some diced potatoes if they're around, and whatever else kind of vegetable stuff she wanted to throw in. My parents like to do things, as many good Roman Catholic families did, they like to do things at the holiday time for the priests. Um, us kids, and I've written about this too, us kids would joke about, gee, you know, if we were a priest or a nun, we might, we might have to get some good cooking around here. But she used to love to make coconut macaroons. And here's where the story gets a little sideways. We would love when she made coconut mac macaroons. Um, we weren't allowed to have any of them. They were for the priests, for the rectory. We weren't allowed to have any of them except the ones that didn't turn out right. So again, I've written about this. All us kids would just be ear to ear smiling and hoping and saying our prayers that there'd be a batch or two that didn't come out right. Maybe they were too squishy in the middle. Maybe they were too brown on the bottom. Maybe they were too brown on the top. Didn't matter. If they were deemed unacceptable for the priests, well, then we got to eat them. We got to eat a lot of coconut macaroons, even though they weren't made for us. So I've written about that. Is that that's a story of my siblings growing up. That's a story of, of my parents. So why do I have a peach pie in here uh, when my mom didn't bake pies? We bought cherry pies and apple pies from Scott's, now Kroger, uh, and baked them. Uh, that's not really making the pie. My family now, including my sons, make pies from scratch with making the pie crust and the pie shell and the innards of the pie. I love peach pie, so of course I'm going to have peach pie. Um, but everyone makes that now. So I've written about that. Uh, we went from frozen store-bought pies to home cooking pies. We can write about that. A third writing prompt is pick a word. Pick a word that emotes, emotion. Pick, pick a word that kind of entices us to think, but pick a word. Um, a good friend, a really, really good dear friend um, and colleague, uh, Paul Milner and his wife, Carol Becker, are amazingly expert at Christmas letters, which we'll get to in just a moment. But I was just so impressed more than a decade, decade ago, I think it was around 2008, got this awesome Christmas letter from Paul and Carol. And they did this entire letter around one word. And I'll get to it in a minute. Well, I'm going to get to it right now. The word was ritual. They wrote the entire Christmas letter around ritual. We don't have time to go through the whole letter, but it was amazing. It was just absolutely amazing, masterful work. So they start the letter with talking about Carol's dad, who you know, on the more mature side of life, a little more forgetful. And Carol talked about the ritual when he spent some time with them of just making coffee for him. Yes, you can write about that. Um, and, and it was an amazing, touching, very simple ritual. And they talked about the ritual of saying goodbye to Carol's mother. And wow, you can't help but be there through the words. And the ritual of making a promise and getting married. 
the ritual of graduation. Oh my goodness, what an amazing letter. So pick a word, um, any word you want. It can be hammer. Um, I like more emotional words. So write around the word longing. Have you longed to do anything? Yeah, I long to have my own room at home. Okay, so what was it like growing up in a household where there were five kids and three bedrooms? Uh, you know, most of us can do that now. So a big writing prompt, find a word. So we've talked about pictures, we've talked about recipes, find a word. Related to finding a word, find a record, right? Write around a record. Most of us have file cabinets or computer file folders full of records, documents. Write around a document. So this is a document from my in-laws. Remus Pig. I like surnames like that. So the, 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 the pigs actually married farmers on my in-law side of the family. So here's Remus Pig, and here's a death certificate. You might think, big deal, but you could write about what you believe about this person based on information here in the death certificate. So you see about midway down the page, he's a farmer. We're gonna enlarge the bottom left-hand portion. And who's the undertaker? The undertaker is the family. Oh my goodness. Back there in Lee County, Kentucky, in the 1800s, yeah, well, early 1900s. Yeah, not many morticians, undertakers around. You can write a story around this document. This is my father's uh, military record, and he spoke almost nothing about his military service. I learned what's at the very bottom here, Korean Service Medal, United Nations Service Medal, etc. I got those four medals when he died. He never mentioned a thing about those medals, not a thing. I'm still on a quest to find out more details about them. Up at the top, it says cryptographer. He told us that, and as kids, I remember, and I've written about this. You have things in your life that you can write about. He told us this little saying that he was told by his commanding officers and by his team of cryptographers. What you see here, what you do here, when you leave here, leave it here. In other words, don't tell anyone about this. So he coded and decoded government messages. So, um, you know, as a kid, that's pretty awesome. As an adult, still think that's pretty awesome. Sure would have appreciated knowing a little bit more about that, but I think I'll be able to uncover more things and I can create a recovery path for his story by writing about it. So picture, recipes of cooking, a word, a record. Fifth, writing prompt, specialty newsletters or specialty letters. Create a specialty letter, be creative. So a progressive letter. Again, my father-in-law, as the world's best grandfather, you know, wrote a progressive letter with his, at the time, living eight siblings. He was one of nine siblings. Um, but you can have a progressive letter with neighbors, with cousins. A progressive letter just means you key something and send it or write something and send it and ask the person to tag on to what you have written and write what your writing has prompted them to think about. Um, a number of us have probably experienced progressive letters, but it can happen with family members, neighbors, colleagues, church members, you name it. You can do this with any close group of people interested in sharing. So my father-in-law wrote this progressive letter with his siblings. You know, it all began um, for him in Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you love to be in Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky, from Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky? Um, it just sounds so much more eccentric than Fort Wayne or Indianapolis. But so he's writing about his first memory. He's three years old uh, in this next page. Um, he left Wild Dog Creek in 1916. He remembers his younger brother being carried. He was only three. He wishes he had been carried. Oh, look here. Charlie made a mistake. He forgot to put the EM in remember. Big deal. Remember, we said we didn't care. He's the one that went back and corrected it. And I want to show you this next page because um, he talks about the flu. What flu do you think he's talking about? As a young child, he experienced the Spanish flu. Same kind of thing. 
same kind of pandemic that we're experiencing today. So in just two generations, and this next page, you know, talks about it. So 1919, still in the pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic, they were on the move again. So an amazing progressive letter, over 30 pages, three zero pages contributed by this family. Um, we can do that. We should try to do that. And the goal isn't to, okay, Kurt said 30. I'm going to write a progressive letter that has 31 or 41 or 51. The idea is to get people engaged. We can help excite each other about writing and sharing, and we can help jog each other's living memory and encourage each other to put that on, on paper. So event letters. If you don't want to do a progressive letter, holiday greetings, reunion letters, um, quarterly grandparents update. They call them gramps updates, semi-annual chillin check-in, check-in with the children. Do whatever feels right, feels comfortable, but do something. Use events that you're celebrating anyway to be writing prompts for you to key or to write information. We're running short on time as we typically always do in these presentations. Um, Paul Milner and his wife, Carol Becker, have done such an awesome job. I just have a couple snapshots of beautiful Christmas letters, holiday greetings from Paul and Carol over the years. This is this year's holiday greeting where they share really personal experiences about a challenge in their life and about, you know, fantasy, support, love, advertising, drugs, aging. Be creative. This is the one from 2019. Tell me your story, said the innkeeper to Joseph and Mary when they knocked at the door. Tell me your story this Christmas. Who are you? Why are you here? And so they went, they used that sort of posture to go and craft another wonderful letter. So they're using writing prompts to share and to bring back parts of living memory and record those. A year before that, they did a snapshot theme. Here's one snap. Here's a second snap. Here's a third snapshot. Use whatever works for you. And if you don't want to be as creative as they are, there's no grading here. There's no has to be this way. This was a pretty plain Jane keyed and sent an email and also sent in paper from a different individual on the East Coast in 2016 who had a particularly rough year. But look what's happening in this Christmas letter. Sad and challenging year, lost a family member. Look at all these family members in this middle paragraph listed. Pretty amazing. We can do that same thing with each year in our life. We can do that same prompting of our living memory and commitment to keying that and putting it on paper. Paul Milner actually shared this article with me fairly recently, less than a month old, from The Economist, December 19th of 2020. No. Christmas letters are, you know, a form of slow social media. So all of you who embrace social media, well, writing these progressive letters, Christmas letters, holiday letters, event letters like reunion, reunion letters, that, that's a form of, of sharing of social media. Pretty awesome things. A final writing prompt on this screen, there's six of them here and I have a couple more just to throw in at the very end. Um, use a calendar as a writing prompt, right? Writing on a calendar or writing a calendar can become a foundation for a holiday letter. If you can commit to at least once a week, and I hope it would be more than that, just scribble a few sentences or even just one sentence or maybe even just a half a dozen words about what happened today. Uh, Welcome to new awesome colleague. Saw a couple of dogs just having the best time in the neighbor's backyard, running and tugging, enjoying the cold winter snow. Fill a calendar, fill those calendar blocks with little things like that. It's a way to trick yourself. I put the word in quotes, a way to trick yourself into writing a diary. So you fill out a few blocks every week on a calendar or maybe every block on a year's calendar. Voila, what do you have? You have a diary. And I include that in the extras portion on your handout. How can you be a better writer, be a better reader and read some letters and diaries? Um, other writing prompts, um, use things that you read or hear as a writing prompt. And I have two to share with you. One from just this past weekend. Um, I was listening to a Sunday morning talking head show. Yeah, I, I like to do that, even though I have to confess that 
much of what is said on Sunday morning talk shows is nauseating at some level. But they were interviewing someone who was a playwright in his 90s. His daughter and son-in-law had quarantined two weeks just to be with him over the holidays. What an act of love that is. We can write about that, that, that act of love concept in our own lives. And the reporter asked him, so, you know, you're in your 90s. What do you think your legacy is going to be? And, you know, how you grappling with your ultimate demise? And this isn't an exact quote, but this is how I remember what he said. He said, going is okay, like an adventure. I thought, well, that's a neat way of thinking about death, about our demise. But I really like what he said next. Leaving is the hard part. I don't like leaving, leaving our loved ones behind. And that is the hard part. And what did that phrase do to me? And I wrote about it that day. Yeah, how hard was it for me? when this family member died, when that friend passed, when this colleague passed, and all those memories come back and I can put some of living memory on paper. So writing puns. I ran across this saying years ago, easily a decade ago. I liked it for some reason. And every time I read it, I could write some things right now if I wasn't in the middle of this presentation. Sometimes memories leak out of my eyes and roll down my cheeks. Just that concept of equating tears to memories. Wow, that can be a writing prompt for us. Use these things as writing prompts. So I gave this book to a colleague of mine when she and her husband adopted their first child. I had come to know about it just a couple of months before. But Jamie Lee Curtis's book, Tell Me Again About the Night I Was Born. And it's about the excitement of parents who are adopting a child. And this is just one page out of it. Tell me again how the phone rang in the middle of the night and they told you I was born. Tell me how you screamed. I thought, well, how excited I was when our four boys, each one of them was born. And how I was so honored to be here squeamish Kurt, hypodermic phobic Kurt was present in every one of my child's births and I didn't feel squeamish. I felt like overwhelmed with the gravity of of the moment. Um, so I heard Jamie Lee Curtis years ago at an American Library Association conference. She was a keynote speaker. And she was railing on the serenity prayer, which already made me love her even more. And she said, everyone focuses on the first phrase. Oh God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And she says, I like the second phrase, courage to change the things I can't. And so I have written a number of things about myself, my family, my career, about this phrase courage to change the things I can. So use what we read and what we hear as, as writing prompts. Um, we can use the news of the day, local or national, as writing prompts. We've all experienced a pandemic, write about it. It doesn't have to be the blow by blow if you don't want it to be. It doesn't have to be the gravity of life or death situations if you don't want it to be. Your unique experiences with your unique words. Our kids are involved in different kinds of learning. My kids thought it was so awesome that their grandfather learned in a one-room schoolhouse and grew up and taught in a one-room schoolhouse in Kentucky. I've written many times about that. The riots in D.C. recently, the riots over the summer in our community and elsewhere, or whatever else you want to write about. Use news as, as a writing prompt. Um, finally, self-interview. We have all kinds of questions in the life stories section of the Genealogy Center's page, questions you can ask other people when you're interviewing them. Why not ask yourself? Ask yourself, what are some of the most important lessons you've learned in life? What are you proudest of in your life? I, I grappled with the second one. I shouldn't say grappled. I've used the second one for decades. It changes. And sometimes I feel bad about it changing. And then it's like, well, it is what it is. Sometimes I'm really proud about this. Sometimes I'm really proud about that. Sometimes my sons, one or the other of them, will do the most amazing yet simple everyday things. And it just makes you pause and say, wow. I don't care if he's my son or not, but what an amazing human being. Can you remember a time in your life when you felt most alone? When was the last time you cried and why? I'm kind of a crier, so I could write several books just on that. Writing. Equate it with something enjoyable. Take time to experiment. 
What's the right time of day, place? Are you going to write or are you going to key? How are you going to do it? But figure it out. The times of our lives, our stories truly are in our hands. And I hope that I've given you some ideas about how you can write your family stories.